Welcome to a very different episode of my series where I typically review old, obscure, or controversial games. This time I've got a bundle of obscure games united by a common theme, abstract, dreamlike, or unusual visuals. Hopefully extra emphasis on the dreamlike part. In the previous games I've covered, I've complimented surreal visuals surprisingly frequently. This made me think, well, why not do a video on games that are intended to be bizarre, abstract, and dreamlike? Since you're in control, video games are the ideal way to convey dreams, insert allegory to lucid dreams here. You need to have the freedom to explore the dream world. Some games can really feel like you're playing through someone else's dreams, and I get a kick out of that. One thing I really love about Morrowind is the dreamy feel its world has. Gained a once per video Morrowind reference out of the way pretty quickly this time. Regardless, I've always had a fascination with dreams and general dream flavored media. These games won't necessarily be walking simulators, but they'll be pretty closely related. This video is gonna be more informal than my other work, since I can't quite do the same level of formal analysis with games that are intentionally light on mechanics. In fact, much like these games themselves, my writing is overwhelmingly going to be stream of consciousness in this one. This collection is about repeatedly putting one foot in front of another and admiring some Salvador Dali or Jackson Pollock artwork. Maybe some Le Corbusier in there too. Regardless, these games are generally adventures through artsy, dreamy worlds. I'm looking for something properly dreamlike here, but good surrealism is fine by me too. Now, I do want to quickly get three things out of the way. For the sake of making this video a bit more interesting, RPG Maker games are not allowed. So no Yume Niki, Dot Flow, Space Funeral, etc. I made this rule so I'd have to delve a bit deeper into the catalogs. I'm probably showing some Yume Niki footage on screen for the sake of this intro anyways, but ignore it. Maybe I can do some of these games in a future video. Regardless, there's an astounding amount of Yume Niki fan games out there since it's a tried and true formula, but I wanted to give some love to more experimental titles. Also, since these games are often best experienced relatively blind, I'm going to mostly avoid showing too many highlights. Part of fun in these sorts of games is getting caught off guard or finding something yourself. As a result, my footage may be a bit more milk toast and random than usual in this video. Lastly, this video may contain flashing lights or other forms of unwarranted eyeball violation. I'd personally rather this video not kill someone since I can't afford to murder anyone at this point in my life, so I will generally try to edit these out or do what I can to make them less awful. With these sorts of games, it's hard to avoid absolute cacophonies of colors blasting straight into your face. Bright colors beam directly into the brain. If there's one game in this video that the photosensitives should especially skip, it's Strawberry Cubes, which will be the first game I cover. It's basically impossible to edit the flashing lights out at one. Here's a timestamp to skip it on screen. I'll give you a few moments. You good? Well, unfortunately for anyone who skipped, they won't get to experience the most unique game here. Strawberry Cubes is a sole platformer in this video, and it's easily one of the most surreal games I've ever played. Probably my favorite of today's bundle of games, too. This game is part of an absurdly obscure and patently indie genre known as glitch games. The idea here is that the gameplay is highly reliant on the game having exploitable quirks and general weird things to do. An example of this is the fact that you're able to use multiple teleport abilities in conjunction to move platforms between screens, or how you can use your clones to phase through walls. Most of the buttons on your keyboard do something, it's just your job to figure out what they do and how to interact with each other. Strawberry Cubes doesn't seem to have a story and it has no definitive goal. You're thrown right into the game, just like that. Threats are limited and even if you do die, you have unlimited lives. Heck, you actually can't even properly jump. Instead, you're reliant on your ability to literally grind up walls face first like Tony Hawk. This game is, more than anything else, about exploration. What weird things can you find in this incomprehensible platformer world? How can you use your glitch abilities, that the game tells you almost nothing about, to your advantage? Frankly, I can't really say I figured this game out, which is probably the way the developer wants you to feel. Heck, I didn't even beat it, assuming the game actually has an ending of some sort. Most of my playtime was spent confused, in a good way, I'd say looking for items and trying to figure out what the keybinds were. The map is rather mystifying and arbitrary, again, obviously by design. Everything is so out there, nothing serves an obvious purpose, if any. Strawberry Cubes is a game that has a dedicated return to the first room button, and trust me when I say that, you'll need it from time to time. It also has a dedicated change the color of the walls button. This means that there's a dedicated button that can turn Strawberry Cubes into blue raspberry cubes. Did you know older forms of raspberry flavoring were harvested from beaver butt? I actually quite like this game. It's mysterious, out there, and rather hypnotic. The harsh reds, incomprehensible tiles, strange imagery, Gordian knot level layouts, baffling gameplay mechanics, and abundant secrets all make for a highly unique experience. In fact, in this game's readme, it suggests you draw a map, usually a dead giveaway you're in for a cryptic experience. 
I didn't do that so I could experience the madness full hog. Allegedly, this game gets more and more corrupted the longer your play session goes on for, though I couldn't tell if that was the case. There seems to be some random element since rooms can temporarily change on later visits, though I have no idea why this is the case. Which, I guess, checks out. Of course, this game has a standard issue any goalless game would have. There are these weird collectibles, but it's unclear if they serve any purpose. There's no real sense of progression to this game as a result. In games like Yume Niki, you have to find items, which can sometimes be used in specific ways in the world. To beat Yume Niki, you need to find all of the effects. Here, you do unlock abilities as you go, but that's not necessarily the goal of the game. The game isn't even confirmed to have an ending, as far as my research went, so there's no genuine end goal to work towards. That's a bit of a shame in my mind. A game like this should have at least a very goal or something to convey a sense of progression. So Strawberry Cube is ultimately a bit of a maze wanderer. Plenty of secrets and weird stuff to find, though the world generally makes no sense and flows like a fever dream. There's probably a college art project poem you can piece together from all the secret rooms. And if you want to analyze it as a platformer, the actual platforming is borderline non-existent. Strawberry Cubes is highly focused on exploration, manipulating its glitch mechanics anyhow, which is more compelling than platforming to me. Definitely my favorite game of today. I've never played anything else quite like it before. Well, I've played platforms before, just not one where I needed to find out how to phase through walls, warp platforms across screens, and cryptically bend the game's rules to my advantage. It's a unique game that feels like it probably hides a surprising amount of secrets. I honestly doubt I delved too far beyond the surface of this one, but what I saw was pretty enticing. It's free, so I recommend giving it a spin for the heck of it. You basically have nothing to lose, not even storage space, because it's only like 2 megabytes. Let's move on to a fairly humble indie title, Catacombs of Solaris. YouTube's compression algorithm is probably going to absolutely hate this one. The best description for this is that it's a dizzying color vomit simulator. The visuals are like pressing your face against a TV. Did you do that as a kid too? I'm nearsighted today, so I wonder if there's a correlation. Regardless, these noisy visuals are a stark contrast to the complete lack of sound. That's why I've just quickly slid in music from a game I've covered before on my channel here. Anyways, Catacombs of Solaris here is an endless maze wanderer. Your goal is as abstract as anything else, finding your favorite room in the catacombs. Hey, that's a goal, and boy am I good at finding my way through catacombs. This game may look uninteresting at first, until you realize the world shifts around you when you pause in place. I went to this game blind, and got freaked out when it first happened. It's an interesting little perspective mechanic that can be genuinely dizzying at times. The low FOV really doesn't help, though, I guess it lends to the dizziness factor that the game's probably going for. As far as I'm aware, there are no special rooms or anything like that. It's simply an endless array of rectangular corridors. If you ask me, you win this game once you make a monochromatic room. You literally can't see anything at that point and need to reset the maze. Since this game is otherwise goalless, you do have to make a bit of your own fun. Catcom is ultimately a cute little title about exploring a weird abstract expressionist painting. Probably the shortest game I'll ever cover on my channel as your playthrough, in quotes, would be about 5 to 10 minutes of wandering and goofing around. Since it's free, I'm fine with it. Well, the version I'm playing is free. For whatever reason, this game has a $12 revised edition. What in the world is there to revise here? And there's no universe where I would pay 12 bucks for this anyways. It's a fun novelty game, something to bring up when discussing weird indie games or its cool perspective mechanic, but that's about it. It. It's simply a charming novelty. You know how I said no RPG Maker games? A Yume Niki fan game still managed to weasel its way onto here, primarily because it's built upon the build engine of all things. Sure, it's eDuke32, but the engine is still foundationally held together as spit and a prayer to Moloch. Anyways, Yume Niki 3D is, as the title suggests, Yume Niki but in 3D. I was expecting a faithful 3D recreation, but this game is mostly its own thing. You still play as Mado Tsuki, going to sleep, exploring her dream worlds, and collecting effects. Most worlds are new, though there are some returning locations here and there. Naturally, since it's literally Yume Niki, there's stuff borrowed directly from the original games, such as the Mars event in Uboa. I spent way too long trying to trigger Uboa, since you need to exit the house each time you flip the lights. I was flipping that light for an unreasonable amount of time, to best put it. Yume Niki 3D, or YN3D as I'll call it from now on, is definitely stylistically different than the original, though you can certainly see the influences. It's lighter on the weird looping abstract worlds, that's for sure. Effects are mostly carryovers scattered across a new set of locations. The bicycle is in the haunted streets, by the way. You're welcome. The goal is to find all of the effects and bring them back to this bizarro room. Unfortunately, the game doesn't really have an ending, so beating it doesn't mean much. It's also much shorter than the original Yume Niki and has far fewer effects. You can reasonably see everything the scheme 
team has to offer in about an hour or so. There's actually a lot of borrowed assets in this game. Obviously stuff like Uboa and less obvious stuff like the viruses from William Shatner's Tech War. Notably, this game has numerous tracks sampled directly from Gary Newman because why not? Some prog rock band samples in here as well, highly appropriately. I guess we know Mato Tsuki's musical tastes now. Weirdest of all is a sample from a Blue Oyster Cult song. You know, the guys who made Don't Fear the Reaper. I thought they were a one-hit wonder for the longest time. Anyways, I've had to mute the audio from this game. Usually I'd give you at least a quick highlight reel of the music, but oh well. At least most of it is fitting. It's overwhelmingly short 5 or so second loops, though they consistently add to the atmosphere and never really came across as grating. Despite all of the borrowed assets, there is still some originality, bizarreness, and quality to some of the worlds you can explore. I always like the no smoking maze, so it's a weird but endearing location. The abandoned house has a good foreboding feel to it. I like the atmosphere of the haunted streets as well. Little child Matotsuki has the strength to push a car around. Pretty unrealistic no matter how you view it since your arms and legs both turn into spaghetti in dreams. I do like a decent chunk of the worlds and there are some nice compromises between the surreal and the dreamlike. Though there are still some bad worlds here. I remember hearing people raving about the horrors of the monkey corridor, but experiencing it myself, I honestly found it more funny than anything else. There's also the seizure world, which I'm not going to show you for obvious reasons. I'll show you the entrance to it so you don't have to literally die. Going in there is mandatory for being the game, by the way. If there's a fairly consistent problem across all of the worlds is that most of them are weird first, cohesive second. A good few worlds feel more like asset hodgepodges than thematically cohesive places. The original Yume Nikki was like this at times though, so swings and roundabouts. Frankly, I'm not too sure what to think about Yume Nikki 3D overall. It's a cute homage to original Yume Nikki and an understandable evolution of the formula. It's just a shame that it's substantially smaller in scope and rather lacking in events, effects, and environmental interactions. You could reasonably blind clear this in one hour, a stark contrast to the original which could take well over a dozen hours. But wait, that's not all. Order now and you'll get this game's baffling expansion isolated free! It's not so much an expansion as much as it is an extra standalone game to give the game an actual ending. It's completely independent from the main campaign and consists of a short, linear set of levels. I find the linearity to be a downgrade in this case, and most of these levels are rather forgettable. Well, actually, there is one memorable thing it throws at you. The non-consensual ear violation room. Seriously, turn your sound way down once you reach this great corridor. Kind of a douchebag move, and it killed most of the respect they could have had for this part of the game. This expansion is also a rather half arsed attempt to throw some extra dark backstory and deep lore in there when one of the things that made the original Yume Nikki great was its subtlety. There's a lot of ambiguous symbolism that let you speculate why Marutsuki locked herself in a bedroom and what might have happened to her. Subtle symbolism such as this guy who's definitely not a wacky waving inflatable arm flailing giant cock. Here, this backstory feels phoned in, and it's too ambiguous to really come to any conclusions. It's a bizarre misunderstanding of the original Yume Nikki and the sense of mystery it had. I mean, I suppose Yume Nikki 3D is worth a go if you're really hungry for more content inspired directly by Yume Nikki, or if you just want a short, condensed Yume Nikki fan game. It's an hour-long experience that gives you a tolerable, in-and-out taste of dream exploration action. Even in spite of its flaws, there is still some fun to be had in exploring this dissonant world. The expansion isn't really worth it unless you just want a little bit more, and it really should have been integrated into the base game instead of being standalone. Electric Highways is the next game on today's hit list. Made by the same guy who made YN3D, it's a bit more of the same, though it's in first person this time. Still running on eDuke32 as well. However, it's definitely a more focused and original experience that places extra emphasis on the music. Overall, it feels like playing a quirky indie electronic music album because that's literally exactly what it is. This is a game about exploring a variety pack of small, disconnected worlds with unique themes. It's the most linear game in the lineup, though there is a level you can miss if you don't figure out the secret knock. Electric Highway is mostly about finding switches and keys, which are never hidden in overly obscure locations. It can easily be beaten in half an hour or so, which, again, is fine for a free game. Each world definitely got more attention here than YN3D, though there's also considerably fewer worlds. I prefer this quality over quantity approach, so it's all good. They're waiting for you, Gordon, in the time-wasting chamber. The major selling point of this game is supposed to be the music, I think. 
Personally, I'm not too wowed by it overall. It's nothing bad, far from it, and there's a decent bit of variety. The thing is, I wouldn't go out of my way to listen to most of it again. I assume the music was composed first and the levels are designed as interactable pseudo-music videos. A rather cool concept, actually, so it's a shame not too much of the soundtrack leapt out at me. I think this whole gamified musical video thing is executed fairly well here. I guess I can give you a teaser of the tracks I like the most. I find that the levels are a little bit more interesting than the music, frankly. Again, it's little bites of varied, bizarre worlds to explore. I like that. Electric Highway simply does whatever it wants with the levels, so there's no real overarching or underarching or midarching or whatever themes here. These are actually some of the more properly dreamlike levels of any game in this video. A lot of dream games go too heavy on the abstract factor, whereas the worlds in Electric Highways vaguely resemble places. Listen, I've never had a dream where I was in an Aztec confetti vomit void, but I have had dreams about parks, highways, and space stations. I have no idea if this is what the developer was aiming for, but bonus points for leaning towards being authentically dreamlike. Also, this game has a couple brief sections where you get to run around whacking inanimate objects with a lead pipe. Arguably, it's the most complex the gameplay gets. It's rather satisfying. I feel like they nailed the sound work with it. It's an oddly pointless mechanic though, since it's really only used to break some glass in order to progress. Makes you wonder if there's originally more ambitious plans for it like combat, which ultimately fell through. Still, for whatever reason, I just can't get sick of smashing urns and glass in this game. There's something so satisfying about it, I don't know what it is man, just something about it makes it really- Electric Highways is alright. It's a cute, short adventure you can easily complete in one sitting. Not too much story or gameplay here, just a simple, somewhat dreamlike visual and aural experience. Definitely the kind of thing I was looking for when I started making this video, though I wish it had more meat on its bones. It left me wanting a bit more, which is actually a pretty good thing. Even though the soundtrack doesn't completely resonate with me, I give Electric Highways a thumbs up. Zero Degrees North, Zero Degrees West, or as I'll call it from now on, Oh Now, is an extremely non-linear game in comparison to the previous two titles. It allegedly has an ending, but I didn't find it. Beyond finding this alleged secreted away ending, it ultimately doesn't have any goals and is more about taking into sights and sounds of ridiculously abstract and distorted worlds. Without question, Oh Now strays much further from reality and recognizable imagery than any other title today. It goes all in on abstract visuals and sprawling levels. It emphasizes bright colors, trippy patterns, surreal scenery, all with a hint of glitchiness. It's hard to make out what you're looking at in the bright technicolor vomit you'll be wading through. Without question, it's one of the most visually intense games I've ever played. I can imagine it inducing a migraine in someone, maybe an aneurysm too if you really, really hate the weird blurry filters a game violently slathers across the screen. Oh Now is within walking simulator territory due to its near total lack of gameplay mechanics. Thankfully, you are blessed with absurd speed and a superhuman jump. Yet another protagonist who's grown in a test tube next to Usain Bolt's. The worlds are massive, so it is great that you're so spry. There's a decent variety of worlds to explore, though you can definitely tell when they're different variations of the same general landscape. Not necessarily repeats, but you can easily tell that most worlds have a couple palette swaps. Beyond the sites themselves, there isn't too much to each world. No special events, no story to piece together, no significant secrets, etc. Also, there are many transitional segments between worlds. They're rather weird because you generally need to hold a direction key down for a little bit to exit them. Some can be an assault on the senses, whereas others can be fairly pleasant. Some of them flashy like back alley denizens, so watch out. It's very much a minimalist explore weird worlds game, and I can take that, so long as exploration feels good. You knew there was going to be a caveat as soon as I finished that sentence, didn't you? A bit like Strawberry Cube, this is another case where the complete lack of a clear, definitive end goal ends up hurting the game dramatically. In fact, I'd say it's exponentially worse here since there is seemingly little to nothing to find as you delve deeper, not even cool, obscure set pieces. 
Sure, maybe if all you want to do is take it into environments, it's not a big deal. But for me, without any sense of progression, it's much harder to enjoy exploration. Unique discoveries would give so much more life to environments like these, but Ono doesn't have anything of the sort. To repeat myself, Yume Niki gave you items to seek out across the worlds, in addition to there being plenty of optional sites to see, secrets to find, and NPCs to interact with. Nothing remotely like that here. Whenever I thought I found something that could be interactable, I then remembered this game doesn't even have an interact key. And these interesting items are so profoundly few and far between, it's actually rather disappointing. Here's the real kicker though. Traversal is seemingly random in this game. Should you ever go out of the same exit in the same area twice, you are unlikely to arrive in the same world on the other end. This is genuinely awful if you ask me. A game like this needs a sense of delving deeper and deeper, but how can you experience that when you're being randomly hugged between worlds like a cross-dimensional pinball? The initial sense of discovery rapidly fades out once you realize you have minimal agency over exploration and that repeat worlds are fairly common. And that's on top of the palette swaps, by the way. It wasn't long before I was being tossed back and forth between the same handful of worlds over and over. For the first hour of a blind playthrough, there is a sense of discovery. Put more than an hour into this game and you'll probably realize just how illusory that feeling was. Honestly, you want to know what I think this game is? What it should have been advertised as? A desktop wallpaper generator. It feels like a lot of this game was designed to look good at a standstill. I do use the word designed loosely with some of the visual vomit on display here. Still, you could take a screenshot at nearly any given moment and it's guaranteed to make for a good wallpaper. For that purpose, this game is excellent. For other purposes, I mean, I guess it's okay to subpar. It's definitely supposed to be more meditative than anything else, and that's honestly not necessarily what I'm looking for in these sorts of games. Overall, I think that Onow is a case of missing potential. If there was a better sense of discovery and interaction, I would have liked this game much more. As it stands, it's a goalless, storyless walking simulator through Acid Trip injected directly into Eyeballs Land. This game does cost money, so just know what you'd be getting into if you do decide to buy it. Friction 3 of 3, whatever that name is supposed to mean, is probably the most baffling game in today's collection. Made by the same developers as Onow, this one is a compilation of 6 short games. I'll talk about them individually. Hey guys, so I accidentally got this game's title wrong in my voiceovers here. It's actually Friction F3F and not 3F3. I'm not recording Andy's lines again because this game doesn't deserve it. First off is Karkovas. By the way, I have no idea what the names for most of these have to do with the games themselves. This one is actually rather promising, so it's a shame so little is done with it. It's a big, sprawling step with a day-to-night cycle. The visuals are highly pixelated and the models are vague, which creates a good sense of mystery when you can't identify what's on the horizon. Seeing motion in the distance genuinely generated a small amount of tension. It's mostly passive wildlife and your pet dog, though. Not sure what the point of the dog is. Probably because most reviewers would give extra points for the dog, but I'm not most reviewers, so I I deduct a letter grade for it. I like the fact that this level is more connected to reality per se than most other levels in this video. It makes it feel more like an actual dream rather than an abstract artist's brain tumor induced wet dream. I have no idea if there's a true way to beat this one because the only way I was able to beat it was by jumping off the edge of the map. My reward for the long run to the edge is being booted back to the main menu. Okay? Beyond that, there's little to see or do here. It would be an understatement to say that there's a lack of interesting things to find. And for some reason, going far enough out turns the world monochrome white. These developers really love that filter, huh? Ultimately, the map is far too big relative to how few notable things there are to see. Much like the crazy, just-discovered Sony Vegas screen filters, that's a theme in Friction 3F3. Next up is That Feeling Blue. It's a lot more like what was in O now, just a bit larger, more detailed, and more thematically congruent. It's blue, alright, Dab Dabba die. Pleasantly moody, feels pretty tranquil, and atmosphere is nice. It's not quite something you'd see in a dream, though it has a smidge of that juicy, dreamy feel. It's unfortunately short, but I did enjoy the like 8 minutes I spent in it before beating it. There isn't much more to say for this one, that's about it. Third up is Sands of Voltark. This is genuinely awful. It's a massive sprawling desert this time, and for once you actually have an objective. Hilariously, this objective is basically just follow the power lines, so it's almost worse than no objective. The map is completely unreasonably huge, to the point where sticking to the obvious path still results in about 10 minutes of walking with nothing happening. It's like one of those games from dreadfully written creepypastas back in the day. I also found the endings incredibly underwhelming, which is far more annoying when compounded with a pointless, unskippable 2 minute long cutscene the game opens with. Maybe there's secrets and alternative endings to check out, but in a game like this, finding anything interesting shouldn't be a cryptic affair. 
I shouldn't have to spend minutes upon minutes blindly wandering in a desert to see anything remotely interesting. This particular game isn't worth playing and it's not worth the amount of time it took me to read this paragraph. Then there's... A. I made this joke before, but isn't that the name of Elon Musk's kid? This time, instead of being a tiny goddess of gambling, it's a rather weird short walking simulator with multiple endings. I do sort of like the maps here. The outside is surreal and almost incomprehensible, but still has some landmarks and a vague resemblance to a regular landscape. The inside of the house is genuinely vaguely creepy and claustrophobic, though I really wish the filter was less egregious. This particular game opted for the bizarre, incomprehensible side of things. You can tell just by looking, hearing, feeling, and tasting it. Its endings aren't too much more comprehensible either. The first ending I got, I touched a plume of smoke and... became a cult leader's generic prog rock played, and got a literal 5 minute long text crawl as a reward. I went to the bathroom midway through and it was still going when I got back. There's also an ending for jumping off a cliff, which is just some ear violation and a restart. Then there's an ending for getting in bed with my incorporeal Nyarlathotep wife, where she blared some sirens at me and I died or something. Poom too good. This is some real college art project stuff. I'm not too big of a fan, I really prefer it when the weirdness and surreality comes more naturally. This one isn't awful, but it needs more substance, less forced weirdness, and fewer filters. Next up in the collection is Nightline. I have little to say about this one, even though I saw it on the Steam store page and thought I would like it. It's just an endlessly looping background with train ambiance. I generally like the atmosphere of public transportation at night. A few years back, I would take the bus home from my class around 7.30pm, usually pretty dark and rainy in the winter here at that time, and I always liked that. I have some really fond memories of listening to Aphex Twins' selected ambient works while studying on the bus and walking home. Sure, I did take the bus rather than the train, though this game simply doesn't resonate with me in the way I thought it would. I wonder if it's because of the fact that there's nothing but train ambiance and generic urban cityscape, so it feels a lot more more lonesome and empty than it should be. Oh well, disappointing. And there was a sixth game I didn't even bother recording because it was just wacky polygons viewed through a security camera. Literally no gameplay and it only ran in a tiny window. Worthless. So Friction 3F3? Yeah, I don't care for this one. Has some moments, but they're too few and far between. Relative to the developer's previous title, Oh Now, the sense of discovery, exploration, and adventure are far gone. Oh Now may have had a lot of repeating environments and random navigation, but it still vaguely felt like an adventure through a series of trippy, abstract worlds. Here, you don't get any of that, and you instead get a grab bag of boring, completely disconnected worlds. Wanna know the kicker? I effectively beat all six games within an hour. At least, beat, as far as I'm concerned. The developers obviously have potential, but this game both cost money and was a worse experience in today's lot. I really just can't recommend it. Maybe you should try their hand at a 3D surrealist Yue Niki clone, because I can imagine that actually being quite good. As it stands though, Friction 3 of 3 is a far worse experience than Onow was. It's to the point where I feel like I spent 250 on a bundle of games that would otherwise have been free on itch.io or something like that. So yeah, I didn't like this one. If for any reason beyond human comprehension you have to choose between this game and Oh Now, just pick Oh Now. Fibrillation HD is apparently a game important enough to get that precious HD suffix that nobody really cares about. I'll call it Fibri since I can barely pronounce that word in the first place. This game is more brutalist than anything else today, though it's still weird, surreal, and fairly dreamy. In fact, of all the games on here, this is the only one outright confirmed to have been based on dreams. Technically, it's based on nightmares, actually. It definitely leans into the horror side of things. It's pretty standard indie horror fare, though. It just means that there are some enemies who chase you down, you have limited sprint, and you need a lantern to light the way. The lantern drains your sprint bar for some reason. In fact, the sprint bar taking up the entire bottom of the screen is weird and obnoxious, I don't understand why they did that. The majority of this game doesn't have chasers, so the horror is rather on and off. Aside from its chasers, it really only features one big prominent scare. No jump scares to the game's credit. Now, I quite like the general aesthetic of this game, especially in the later portions. There's a lot of concrete rooms and warped spaces to pass through. My absolute favorite parts were the concrete megastructures close to the end, especially their exteriors. Always something that fascinated me about that look. It's very appropriately surreal and unnatural. This game also has a small dose of Yume Niki thanks to its tribal and South American imagery, just to round out the bizarreness. I quite adore it. The sound design is fairly minimal, though I think it's used to good effect. The music is always very calm, rather serene. Some of it evokes a feeling of floating around in space. Generally, it strongly contributes to the dreamy feel. Once again, it's no soundtrack to come back to, but it serves its purpose well and did stick out a little in my mind. Otherwise, most of the sounds of this game are footsteps. 
Gameplay is fairly minimal in Fibri, usually just exploration with a sprinkle platforming, avoiding bees, and outrunning chasers. You're quite spry for a man in a coma, which means that this game has unexpectedly good feeling movement. This is a very easy game, with there only being one room in a whole game I can imagine anyone having any trouble with. Chasers aren't too hard to outrun, their AI is fairly stupid, and each level tends to be very short anyways, so it's no big deal if you die. For the most part, you'll be hopping level to level, collecting yellow cubes and blue orbs. The yellow cubes open mandatory doors, and the blue orbs eventually unlock a secret level. There is also secrets to find in a handful of levels. Any secrets is a 24 digit code you can piece together which allows access to a small handful of further bonus levels. Level design is linear, there's no backtracking to previous levels and very few optional areas. You typically have an implied objective to collect a certain amount of these yellow cubes, though there's never really placed in hard to reach places. You could basically turn your brain off and still get about 90% of them. Heck, this is probably the easiest 100% completion I've ever had in a video game. Literally, I got all the Steam achievements in just over two hours, I only needed a guide to find a couple secrets and to complete the weird secret robot challenge. I actually don't have too much more to say about Fibrillation HD, all things considered. It's a unique adventure through Le Corbusier's sex dungeon. He keeps giant tribal golems and bees in it. I did like this one, got it for two bucks on sale, and it's an alright deal at that price, especially if you have a soft spot for the brutalist concrete aesthetic like I do. It certainly leans into the walking simulator side of things, but it tries its hand at horror, vague stealth, and light puzzle platforming. I definitely wouldn't have paid much more, but I am glad I got to experience this game and its distinctive aesthetic. Next up, A Broken City. This game is a bit of an eye strain, so some viewers may want to look away. This is definitely in the same league as Catacombs of Solaris, where it's just a quirky, modest title without too much to see or do. Though this one doesn't have that admittedly rather cool perspective gimmick. This one is a moderately large abstract cityscape with a handful of weird things to check out. No real gameplay or goals other than wandering around here, though this definitely feels like a game where you'd be stalked by a slasher villain. Probably by this guy. Adding to that creepy feeling is the fact that the music is in the world itself, which I think adds a lot to the eerie atmosphere. Not too notable of a musical track, really, though it's definitely a net positive contribution to the mood. I like the aesthetic here. In fact, I might be really biased, because I've had dreams about a cityscape that look almost exactly like this before. Interiors and cityscapes in extremely vivid colors are a rather common recurrent element in my dreams. Dreams I had when I was a kid especially were full of bright colors. This game is a strange feeling because of that, since it's almost like someone gamifying all of my own dreams particularly a dream that has been recurrent for almost a decade. So, A Broken City is a completely unexpected deep cut for me. This game is on here because the stars aligned and this weird abstract cityscape ended up hitting close to home. Beyond that, it's an appropriately surreal cityscape dreamscape. I would usually negatively comment about how often the same buildings repeat, but it is a dreamscape and repetition is fairly common in those, so I guess it's fine. Good mood and good aesthetic overall, though I don't care too much for the visual effect on buildings out of the render distance. That there is a patented, a broken city eye strain effect. Could be the latest US government experiment in the artful field of slowly driving people blind. Who knows? Not much more to say here, frankly. There's no story, gameplay mechanics, or anything more to speak of. It's a ten or so minute long trip into a single surreal dream world. Nothing more, nothing less. I almost didn't talk about it, but it really did strongly remind me of my own dreams, so I figured it deserved a spot on here. Like, it's nifty, but there isn't too much to it. It caught me off guard with its familiarity, though that's not something most other people would experience. Should probably skip this one if you don't find the aesthetic exceptionally enticing. Now we've reached a conclusion. Since I covered 8 games in one video, it feels like there should be a lot to talk about. In reality, I'm not completely sure what to put here. Well, what lessons have we learned today? Most of these games are fairly mediocre. Sure, they tend to have cool or unique aesthetics, but they tend to be too light on gameplay for their own good. A lot of these games don't have tangible goals to work towards, or they're lacking a proper feeling of adventure and progression. Oh Now is one of the more obvious cases of that here, with its adventurous aesthetic being packaged with a lack of adventure. Then you have Strawberry Cubes, which actually has quite clever gameplay, but is hurt by its lack of goals and arbitrary level design. Plus, its maps blend together since there isn't much variety to the visuals. Maybe I'm hard to please, but none of these games truly hit the sweet spot for me. Feels like I simply can't find any games that recapture a magic at original Yume Nikki. That's not to say you should skip out on all of these titles. Though. I do have a soft spot for these humble, indie, gameplay light, artsy fartsy games. Probably why I haven't been as harsh as them as I usually would be in one of these videos. Remember, these games are usually made by small teams, if even, and most of the games on this list are free. That inherently gets them the holy trifecta of sympathy, pity, and consolation points from me. Not like that stops me from being harsh on free games though, I made a feature length video about one only for nobody to watch it. Can't all be winners. Anyways, the only game I'd say is abjectly bad here is Friction F3F. It was a universally underwhelming experience. 
Everything else is fair game. If you can only play one game from this collection, I'd recommend Strawberry Cubes above everything else. Otherwise, Fibrillation and Electric Highways are pretty cute, so they're worth a look. Oh Now might be greatly enjoyed by a specific kind of person looking for a game that's more zen than anything else. Or someone looking for a playable wallpaper generator, I suppose. Despite me never having said it, niche appeal seems to be the key words here. These games aren't for everyone, so I can totally see the average Joe bouncing off of most of these. What can you do, really? That's all for today. Tune in next time for something more like my usual speed. In other words, a largely forgotten game made by the oh so world famous developers of legendary household name first person shooter, Will Rock. You know exactly what I'll be covering. I'm trying to maintain a bi weekly upload schedule, but I've had a smaller window to record my voice work for these. Also, I bought Borderlands 3, so I imagine losing a good bit of time to that in the upcoming weeks. Don't expect a video on it though. See you soon, and take care. Don't let the bed bugs bite.